The subject of this short lecture is frostbite. I have based uh, this lecture on the Wilderness Medical Society practice guidelines for the prevention and treatment of frostbite that uh, have been updated in 2019. So if you want to, to read uh, those guidelines, uh, more specific things about frostbite, I recommend to, to do it. Uh, we will talk about the pathophysiology of frostbite, the, uh, the classification, prevention and the therapy. So when it uh, comes to the pathophysiology of the frostbites, there are four overlapping pathologic phases of frostbite. Uh, one of them is pre-freeze, uh, which uh, consists on the vasoconstriction in the area of frostbite and ischemia of tissues. Another phase is three-thaw phase, uh, during which uh, the ice crystal for made or within the cells or outside the cells and uh, the formation of ice crystals um, leads to the cell death. Another phase is vascular stasis in which uh, the vessels uh, constrict and dilate and constrict and the blood may leak from the, uh, from the vessels and also blood coagulates in the vessels. And the late ischemic phase of the frostbites uh, is the tissue ischemia and infarction. And during this phase, uh, there is inflammation process uh, in the frostbite area, the vasoconstriction, then the reperfusion injury, emboli and thrombus formate in the vessels. And uh, um, after all, the, the main, the most important part of the of the frostbite pathophysiology that leads to cell death is the destruction of the microcirculation. And uh, you should differentiate the frost nip from frostbite. Frost nip is the superficial non-freezing cold injury. It's not frostbite, but it may lead to, to frostbite if you if 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 uh, if the patient if somebody does not recognize it and do not start to rewarm. Uh, it's based on the intense vasoconstriction of the vessels on exposed skin of nose, ears, cheeks and fingers. Uh, the ice crystals can form on the surface of the skin and the main symptoms uh, are numbness and pallor as you can see in this picture. Uh, and first Frost nip resolves quickly after rewarming, so the, the numbness goes away and the pallor goes away uh, quickly after rewarming. So that would be the sign of frost nip, not frostbite. Uh, the classification of frostbites. So generally, you should know that uh, we can classify the degree or grade of frostbite only after rewarming because when the tissue is still frozen it's hard it's usually pale it's anesthetic and it's difficult to classify the degree and the, and the grade and we've got few classifications the main differentiation is uh, it's like let's say the classifications are similar to to burning injury so you've got those four degree classification uh, which we would do in the hospital after rewarming and it follows the scheme of uh, of the depth of the burn so generally this four degree classification will tell us what is the depth of the frostbite and uh, and in the field we use two two degree uh, scale for the field classification and there is uh, this four, five grades scale used in the hospital called the Cushy classification, named by the, uh, the, the, the doctor from Chamonix, from France, who developed this scale. Uh, and this scale corresponds to the, to the scale used for burns for the total surface area. So generally here in this case, we, in this scale, we, 
we measure the uh, the surface of the frostbite and uh, this five grade scale will give us the information about the extent of frostbite uh, and using this scale we can predict the tissue loss and predict the amputation risk so uh, to assess the, the degree of the frostbite we use this four degree scale thinking about the depth of the frostbite and this five grade scale thinking about the area of frostbite and here we've got a few examples from for this four degree scale. So the first degree is for a superficial frostbite. Uh, the main symptoms are the numbness of the area, the erythema, and uh, uh, after some time the white or yellow plaque develops and it might be mild edema around the, the frostbite, but there is no tissue loss caused by this first degree superficial the frostbite. The second degree is more deep frostbite but still superficial. It causes superficial skin vesiculation and uh, after rewarming the clear milky fluid blisters developed and they are around those blisters there is erythema and edema. And the depth of this frostbite will not cause the, the loss of the tissue. Uh, more deep and more dangerous frostbite is the third degree. The depth of this uh, uh, it's it's deeper. There is the injury of the reticular dermis, and the injury is beneath the dermovascular plexus. And uh, after rewarming, the deeper hemorrhagic blisters uh, develop, as you can see on this picture. And the fourth degree, the, the deepest, let's say, frostbite is when uh, it extends through the complete dermis then into the subcutaneous tissue uh, sometimes through the muscles and the bones that's a four degree depth of the frostbite uh, as in the field it's quite difficult to assess the degree of the, uh, the depth of the frostbite we can use this two degree scale uh, so superficial a uh, superficial frostbite would be uh, the one corresponding to the first and second degree uh, when there is no or, or minimal anticipated tissue loss. And a deep frostbite would be this corresponding to the third and fourth degree frostbite that would suggest that we anticipate tissue loss. So uh, these were the scales in which we assess the depth of the frostbite. And now I will present the scale, the Cauchy classification, which tell us something about the area of the frostbite. So the first grade <coughs> is the lesion on the distal phalanx, as you can see on the, on the picture here, on the left side. And the second, uh, second grade uh, is the lesion to the middle phalanx, or the proximal phalanx of the thumb of the big toe. Uh, so more, uh, more proximal injury. The third grade is the lesion to the of the proximal phalanx, so whole fingers are, are let's say, frostbitten. Uh, and in the fourth grade, we've got the lesion to the metacarpal, metatarsal uh, area. And then in the fifth grade, we've got the lesion of the carpal and tarsal, so more, uh, more proximal uh, frostbite. Uh, so that's that. That that were the classification of the frostbite. Then. Uh, the frostbite is, is the perfect example of the, of the injury that it's better prevented than treated. So here the prevention is better than treatment because uh, frostbite, uh, frostbite is quite, uh, can be prevented, uh, especially, um, especially among the climbers, there are many, uh, many ways that you can prevent frostbite. Uh, and we should remember that then the frostbite is often difficult to treat and very often do not improve after treatment. So to prevent uh, frostbite, the, uh, the patient, the climber, the trekker should ensure the adequate perfusion of the distal parts of the body, of the fingers generally. Uh, remembering that the blood flow delivers heat, so more blood flow 
uh, more warm will, will be the extremities. As the next thing is to minimize the heat loss, especially from the areas when the heat loss can, um, can appear. As you can see in this picture, the faces of two climbers, uh, the nose and the cheeks are protected by the kinesio tape that is used in the, in the physiotherapy, but can be also attached to the skin to, to add the additional layer that would prevent uh, the direct contact of the cold wind to the face. An important thing is to recognize the cold induced numbness, so frost nip or first degree frostbite. Uh, to, to react, you have to recognize to start reacting, rewarming. What can be do uh, to maintain a peripheral perfusion? So the, 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 there are a few main things. So first of all, the, uh, you should maintain the core temperature and body hydration. So here on the picture you can see the climber with the is drinking the, uh, some fluids from the camelback. So the hydration of the body that would um, ensure the proper circulation, proper perfusion is the, is the important thing. Then uh, you should remember to minimize the effects of uh, diseases like uh, uh, diseases or drugs uh, that would uh, decrease the perfusion. So uh, mm, that would be the important thing. Also, the important thing is to minimize the blood flow restriction. So the boot shouldn't be tied to the put uh, too tight. When you use the crampons, they shouldn't be too too uh, too tight. Then uh, when you spend time. Uh, Immobilize in the tent, waiting for the good weather. You should also move uh, to um, provide a perfusion to the extremities. Uh, ensuring the adequate nutrition is important. Using the oxygen at the altitudes over 7,500 meters is important to, to provide a proper perfusion, proper peripheral perfusion. And of course, exercising movement will give you more heat, will stimulate the peripheral perfusion. But uh, you should be aware of uh, the fact that more exercise is more exhaustion. More exercise needs more energy, so uh, the proper balance uh, should be should be put on the exercise uh, uh, exercise and movement. Uh, the protection from cold is another prevention thing that you can uh, that should be. Uh, should be done. So uh, it's good to avoid environmental conditions with the temperature which are below 15, minus 15 uh, degrees of Celsius, no matter if it's windy or not. Of course, if it's more wind, it's more, there's more danger of the frostbite. Uh, so minimizing cold exposure would be the prevention. Then not using alcohol, drugs, or avoiding hypoxemia, like at high altitude, will give you a chance to um, properly react to changing environment. So if your brain is clear, then if you get cold, you will start to um, search for the shelter. If you are under influence of drugs, alcohol, or if you are hypoxic due to high altitude, then your decisions might be not as adequate as uh, as they should be. Then uh, protect skin from moisture, wind and cold using of course many layers of clothes. Uh, so wearing the clothes like onion styles, onion, like onion, many many layers is, uh, is the best option because it gives you the option to put more layers or if it's more, more warm then you can take off some layers of the clothes. Another thing is uh, that uh, the using emollients on the face is not, uh, is not recommended, that they can even provoke uh, frostbite if, uh, if there's any water in those emollients. Uh, client bears or polar, uh, polar trackers uh, or even uh, skiers, they use chemical electrical warmers. Here on the picture you can see the electrical warmers used by the climbers. 
Uh, you should also avoid perspiration and wet extremities. For example, the problem that at high altitude there is a problem with the with the wet wet inner shoes. So the or during the polar expeditions there is a problem with the wet inner shoes uh, due to perspiration during walking. Uh, polar uh, and and the climbers they they use the special let's say not very special but the system with the plastic bag between the socks to uh, prevent um, um, prevent uh, making the uh, the outer boot the inner in the inner boot wet so after the few hours of climbing the uh, at the end of the day they take off the things the boots and uh, the inner boot is uh, is is dry the, the the woolen socks are dry only the inner socks is wet and it can be easily dried so that's the system used in the polar expedition and, and, and during the climbing expeditions. The important thing is to regularly check for extremity numbness, pain, and rewarm when it's needed, uh, usually by putting your hands under the axilla or close to the ab abdomen. So recognizing frost nips, superficial frostbite, it's important not to get the frostbite uh, uh, deeper. Now a few words about the treatment. So first of all, the field treatment. Uh, because most of the frostbite they, they occur during the uh, some outdoor um, activities. So I would talk something about the field treatment. So first of all, when uh, when you've got the frostbite and it and it thawed in the uh, in the outdoor. Uh, Avoid refreezing because if you refreeze the frostbite, it will be deeper. So um, let's say much risk of the uh, of the tissue loss during the hospital treatment. Remove jewelry or other clothes or, or parts of the clothes from those parts of the body that uh, fingers that that has been frostbitten. Then. Uh, very often frostbites come together with the hypothermia, so you should treat hypothermia. When it's uh, mild, you can treat the frostbite and hypothermia together. When, when the hypothermia is moderate or severe, first treat the hypothermia and then frostbite. Provide hydration or orally or if there is a doctor on the expedition, you can use intravenous fluids. Uh, preferably at the uh, warm fluids 40 42 degrees and give ibuprofen orally uh, because ibuprofen decreases the production of prostaglandins and thromboxins which are responsible for the vasoconstriction and ischemia uh, during the frostbite process uh, the dose would be 12 milligrams per kilogram per day divided in uh, twice daily and let's say there are two options during uh, during the expedition when you would diagnose the frostbite. If you would be in a higher camp, uh, then probably you wouldn't actively thaw the frostbitten part, but you would try to get down to the base camp for the treatment. So in the situation when the frozen part has the potential for refreezing, and it's not actively thought, then uh, what should we do? So, when it comes to the dressings, uh, they should be used only if they are, let's say, practical and they would not interfere with the mobility, so uh, would not, let's say, prevent the possibility to get down to the base camp. If you use dressings, they should be bulky, clean, dry goes, uh, put in between fingers and toes. Uh, what about the ambulation and, and protection? Generally, frostbitten extremities should not be used for walking, but if uh, you've got on the uh, when, you, when you've got no options option because you have to get down to the to the base camp, you of course can use the frostbitten, let's say, feet to to evacuate to to the base camp. Of course, you should know that there is risk that the result 
and the final outcome of the frostbite would be poorer, but it's better to survive than to die with the frostbitten feet. So that's the uh, situation that, that the climber might have at a higher camp. If you go on the frostbitten feet, you should protect those frostbitten parts, frostbitten toes from further trauma. So keep them padded, splinted, uh, immobile. Uh, when you have diagnosed the frostbite in the base camp, you've got more options. Uh, that's a situation when the frozen part can be thawed and can be kept warm without refreezing until the evacuation is completed. So let's say that you're waiting for the helicopter rescue. And, uh, and you know that it won't occur within two hours. So that's time to act. So first of all, the rapid field rewarming by water bath is much more effective than spontaneous slow thawing. So uh, if, uh, if you've got, got an option for the rapid field rewarming by water, do it. So what, the water should be 37, 39 degrees. Uh, you could add some antiseptic solution inside. Uh, the refreezing, let's say, not the refreezing, thawing might be uh, will be painful for the, for the patient. So, uh, or non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen, ketoprofen should be given, or you should you, you could give opiate analgesics uh, just just to ease the pain. And then the therapy should take around thirty minutes, or until the frostbitten parts will be red, purple, and soft when you touch. If you do not have the option for this rapid field rewarming, uh, slow thawing is another option to do, uh, and it should be done if the definite care cannot be reached within two hours. Then, when it comes to the blisters, so generally, uh, routinely, they shouldn't. Uh, sh the brightman of the blister should not be performed in the field. If you've got second degree. Um, depth of the of the of the uh, of the skin, so you've got those clear fluid-filled blisters, and uh, when they are tense, when they are on the on the feet, when there is a high risk that they will rupture by the, by themselves, uh, you can aspirate the fluid, uh, and that, that's a thing to do. But if there are hemorrhagic bulla, so the third degree uh, frostbite, they shouldn't be deprived or aspirated in the field. Uh, you can see here the topical aloe vera cream um, on the fingers, which are frostbitten. So topical aloe vera, so aloe vera reduces prostaglandin and thromboxane formation, so similar let's say, the action that will uh, stop some pathophysiological phases of the frostbite. So the aloe vera should be used on the unroofed blabs under the dressing. The dressing should be bulky, uh, wrapped loosely, because uh, we anticipate that the edema will develop, so the dressing shouldn't constrict the fingers. Uh, when it comes to ambulation, if you're in the base camp waiting for the rescue, you shouldn't, let's say, walk on the frostbitten uh, feet. You should rather protect them from the trauma. Um, the boots that have been removed uh, before the uh, active rewarming, probably due to the demand formation of the, bl uh, of, the, of the blabs, will not be possible to uh, to redown on the on the feet frostbitten feet uh, if you're in the upper camps and use passive thawing uh, the good idea would be to keep the inner boots on the feet because if you will take them off then you might not be able to put them on so that would be let's say um, very difficult situation if you would need to evacuate. Uh, 
elevation of the extremity above the level of the heart would decrease the, um, the, the dependent edema and uh, the oxygen use is recommended if the patient is hypoxic so the saturation is below 88 or you are at altitude over 4000 meters so that's recommended what are the advantages of the hospital treatment so the hospital should be um, preferably reached as fast as possible uh, preferably uh, let's say within 12 hours from the thawing uh, so the same things in the hospital than in the field so the treatment of, treatment of the hypothermia hydration you can give low molecular waste dextran uh, because it decreases the blood viscosity and it prevents red blood cell aggregation and formation of thrombi. So uh, this dextran can be intravenously given if you do not mm, decide for the thrombolysis therapy for the patient. Then rapid rewarming, of course, if uh, if the uh, if there are still tissue is frostbitten. When it comes to the management of the blisters, the same as in the field, so you can con uh, consider draining those uh, clear blisters, but do not touch those hemorrhagic uh, blisters. Uh, topical aloe vera below the dressing. Uh, systemic antibiotic should be used when you've got uh, other significant trauma or signs of symptoms of uh, cellulitis or sepsis. But it's not uh, shouldn't be routinely used as a let's say some, in prophylactic way. That's it's not recommended. And ibuprofen uh, that you should prolong for four six weeks until the frostbite is healed or the surgical management uh, is done. Uh, then the the advantage of the hospital admission is the possibility to perform the Im imaging and to see uh, and avoid the evaluation of an initial injury and the tissue viability. Uh, what can be used, can be, you can use magnetic resonance angiography or technetium uh, pyrophosphate scanning. So use, using those, using imaging can uh, give us also opportunity to, to monitor the progress of the, of the therapy and to guide the time and extent of the amputation. So that's the advantage of the hospital treatment. Another very important thing is the uh, possibility for the thrombolytic uh, therapy with the tissue plasminogen activator TPA. Uh, this therapy can be can be used when when the patient reaches the hospital within 24 hours from th from the thawing. The goal is to release and clear microvascular thrombosis. But of course there are risks. So uh, let's say internal bleeding, uh, bleeding from the catheter site, so all risks of the uh, thrombolytic therapy. But the benefits are, are the benefit is to save save the fingers usually or save the uh, the extremity, the feet or hand. Uh, the thrombolytic therapy is dedicated for the deep injuries um, that are. Of course, potentially uh, that would potentially aid with the severe amputations. So usually, Cushy grades three, five, so proximal frostbite at the proximal level of uh, uh, of uh, proximal phalanx or uh, metatarsal, tarsal, or metacarpal carpal bones. And, uh, and it should be administered within 24 hours of throwing. The best outcomes, of course, are if you get to the hospital earlier. And you've got also here dosing of the TPI that can be um, given intravenously or intra uh, or into intra artery. Mm, still, some scientific uh, research has to be performed to uh, to decide which form is better. Another option is iloprost, which is the prostacycline analog with very potent vasodilatation uh, activity that inhibits the platelet aggregation and has a potential fibrinolytic activity. And uh, uh, iloprost is 
The same as thrombolytic therapy dedicated for very deep injuries, Cushy classification 3 to 5. And it's the best treatment when the TPEA is contraindicated. It can be uh, also administered later, so within 3 days, 72 hours from the injury. Uh, and, uh, and it also can be used in the field. Uh, TPA has been used in the field, uh, in the base cap of K2, 8000 meter peak, with good results. But uh, of course, we should be aware of the risks of using thrombolytic therapy in the field when you have no possibility of scanning or imaging, you've got no possibility to treat the um, side effects of the TPA. And when you use Elopros, there are not such side effects as, as TPA. So it's uh, so expedition doctors should have the Eloprost uh, in their um, in their medical kit, especially when those are the polar expeditions or high altitude expeditions. And the dosing you can see also here on the slide. It's it takes time, like a few days, of of six hours therapy every day of continuous uh, continuous treatment. Um, the end of the hospital treatment is, is the surgical uh, treatment or amputation. Uh, you should be aware the demarcation of the tissue necrosis takes a long time, like one to three months. Um, so the, the, climbers, the climbers say uh, the frostbite in Janu January, the, uh, the amputation in June. So, you know, it takes months to, for the decision to, to amputate. Of course, the imaging assists uh, in the, to, to determine the surgical margins of the amputation. Uh, if there is sepsis, of course, the amputation has to be performed at once. But when there is no sepsis, the amputation should be delayed until definite demarcation occurs, as you can see on this, uh, on this slide, on the pictures of the uh, there is a feed of the climber that reach Everest, but during the summit push, uh, let's say, has this frostbite injury, which ended with the amputation. There are some other treatment that can be used in the hospital, like hydrotherapy. There's a potential benefit to... Mm, so it can be used twice daily, so it is hydrotherapy in the warm water. Heparin is not recommended as monotherapy. It, it should be added to the TPA, uh, and there is insufficient data about the heparin therapy. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy, uh, there's insufficient data about this type of therapy, uh, but it can be added uh, to, to speed up the healing of the, of the frostbite tissue. Okay, thank you very much for your attendance. If you've got any questions, you can mail me. Uh, thank you very much.